Excellent. Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning psalmist writes, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Well, good morning. It's my privilege to welcome you to Kingsway Alliance Church this morning. Um, And we are here gathered this morning so we can do this very thing, exult in the Lord and praise his holy name. So this morning, I just want to first uh, draw your attention to your bulletin. I actually forgot mine, but I think I remember what's in there mostly. So um, one thing I just wanted to note is it, it's listed in there, your, your, um, your faith promise pledge card. We had these in the bulletins last week. There's more in the back. Some of you may have noticed, if you look at that, this is different than any other year previously, in that this year the Alliance has shifted in the way they fund missions to where now missionaries are expected to raise a portion of their support. So you have the option in there to, to, to designate part of your giving specific to certain missionaries if you would like to. So I, it's a little bit complex, but I just want you to know it is, there's a shift in the way the giving is working towards missions in the Alliance. At our annual meeting, I'm going to address that in more detail. Some of you have asked me questions about that. So if you have questions, please come up and talk to me. I'll do my best to help you understand and guide you through that. Um, but I did want to just highlight this. I encourage you, if you have not taken this, and, and use this just as a tool to pray about how the Lord wants you to support missions from a financial standpoint, please do that. And it gives you simple things in there. You know, one is even, I think, just $10, right? Um, weekly, if, even if you do $10 monthly, it's amazing what a difference that will make as we try to impact the nations for Christ. Um, a couple of other just announcements. Actually, I'm gonna have John come up here. We have our, um, our trunk or treat coming up. So Paul, oh, sorry, John is gonna give a, uh, just some details on that. So um, go ahead and come on up, John. Good morning, everybody. So we have our trunk or treat coming up here soon for the kids. And it's gonna be on October 23rd from one to three. So it's gonna be, we're gonna have games, story time, snacks, and then of course we're gonna, if you've never seen it before, we line our cars up all around the parking lot and uh, you're 
your semicircle, and then you open your trunk, and instead of kids knocking on doors and houses, it's a safe place where we're all there, we're all together, and you can see all the kids in their costumes and things like that. But it's going to be from, again, 1 to 3 on the 23rd. There is a sign-up sheet out in the back signing up to bring, like, cookies or cupcakes or things for afterwards for just kind of a time to hang out. Um, am I forgetting any of that? No. Okay. So, yeah, if, if you would please sign up out there. And so, if, if just so we know about what to expect and if we need to supplement or get anything else. But please let us know and we look forward to seeing you there. And, you know, feel free to bring whoever you want to bring. Thanks, John. Um, also, just uh, two last things to highlight. One, uh, October, if you're a man, um, October 30th, it's a Saturday, I'm planning to do what I'm calling just a men's fall fellowship breakfast. And so uh, it's in there, I think I said 8.30. I can't remember, it's listed in your bulletin. Okay, 8.30. Um, I'm, I just want to invite all the men in the church to come out. And we're just going to have a time where we can eat breakfast together. Um, we're going to hang out uh, and hear a testimony of what God's done and in, in, in either my life or someone else's, I'm still working those details out. But I would love for it to be a, a chance for you just to come as men and we can gather and have fellowship with one another and encourage each other in our faith and our walk with the Lord. So um, mark your calendar, October 30th, and we will provide breakfast. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I think maybe I've roped Chris into cooking as well. At least it's public now, so he can't deny it. So. Um, so me and Chris will be cooking if anybody else wants to join us. Um, and just want to invite you to come out and, and be a part of that. Uh, lastly, and this is really important, is our annual meeting is next Sunday. So plan on being here if you can. Like I said, it's, it's not just going over the budget and things like that. It is important in that we elect people to certain positions in the church. But really it's an opportunity for you to hear from, from me and from the elders and, and kind of where we're hoping to go as a church um, and, and also explain things like the financial giving change in the alliance, stuff like that. So, okay, that was a lot of announcements, but uh, please mark that on your calendar. I just want to go back to the, the psalmist's words again. He says, I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Would you join us as we, as we together exult in him and sing, and sing joy to his name and praise him? Thanks. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship our Lord and Christ?
song. So get ready. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, for the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Shit. 
ancient of days, O oh, ancient of days, O oh, ancient of days. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, the children can be dismissed for Children's Church. You guys can head out back. <clears throat> and while the children are heading out for Children's Church, would you just bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we are uh, grateful that we can just praise your name this morning. Lord, I pray for us as we uh, just come before you now to give our offerings to you. Lord, I pray that you would just be honored in our giving, that we would give in hearts of generosity. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, just take this money and that you would use it to be able to reach people for the kingdom of God. Lord, may our giving be out of delight and not out of duty. And again, would you just be glorified in and through this offering in Jesus' name, amen. Don't go away. Uh oh. <laughs> I guess Mary's here. Should I give this to her? <laughs> I don't know. She might be leaving. Yeah. She can go ahead. And leave. Okay. Um, this is Past Appreciation Month, and we appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate you guys too. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, it. Pray for him, okay? Because uh, with the, everything is going on. He needs our prayers, him and Mary both, and uh, we're so appreciative. Okay. Now we're going to try to read. Uh, sorry about that. Interrupting the operatory. <laughs> That's my buddy. That's my buddy. Okay. Take your time. Good to see everybody out today. Uh, you know the leaves are going to be turning, so you're going to have plenty to do shortly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, leaves in the fall time, and, and we're talking about the parable of the sower, and uh, that'll be coming in the spring. Okay. Going to be reading from Mark chapter 4. First 20 verses. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that was gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat, out, sat in it out in the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching, he said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some of the some fell among along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky so on rocky on a rocky place where it had where it did have not have much soil. I'm having trouble reading, Danny. You want to help me? <laughs> I'm sorry. Did not have much soil because the, it, it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they, and they withered because they had no, no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and it grew and produced a crop, multiplying greatly, 30, 60, or even 100 times. And Jesus said, He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked about the parable. And he told them, This is the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. 
But those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they will never, so they may be ever seeing it, but never per- perceiving, ever hearing it, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How when you will, how will, how then will you understand, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown to them. Otherwise, like the seed sown on rocky places, hear the word, and once they receive it with joy, but since they have no root, it only lasts a short time. Then trouble and persecution comes because of the world, and they quickly fall away. Still others, like the seed sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of the, this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Uh, Forgive me for poorly reading that, but may the Lord add his blessing. This this is some parable. And and Jesus said a lot that it's probably going to take a couple sermons to understand, but let's pray, okay? Father in heaven, it's so good to be in this service, uh, to hear the worship team lead us in worship, and just to be thankful for all that you give us. And I pray as, as Eric brings the word to us that you would open our hearts, Father. I pray that you would plant this word deep and that it, it would be fruitful and multiply. Father, I pray for the many that aren't here, either traveling or uh, laid up at home. I pray that you would be with them work in their lives, encourage their hearts, touch their bodies, uh, give them journey mercies if they're traveling. We thank you for all that you're going to do in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Mike, for reading God's Word to us. I just want to say that you you have Mike to thank if we slow down and start going slower. He just requested at least three sermons, I think, for this. So, so um, no. <laughs> it's actually, it's a, it's a long text and it is, um, it's almost hard to fit it all in in one sermon, but we're going we're gonna to try this morning to do our best. This, you know, at our house, we, we have some plants and um, my wife's out there. She's already laughing. I can see her out there. So, <laughs> One thing about plants in our house is, is they have, they have a, a lifespan about as short as a spider if I see it sit, walking across the, you know, the floor right in front of me. They just don't last very long. I guess there's, you need, I don't know, water or sunlight. I don't really know all the things you need. So um, to be honest, though, when it comes to plants growing things, Knowledge of that, I'm pretty much the worst guy that you could ask for advice. So uh, yesterday we had the privilege of going out to a, a farm, uh, somebody's farm, and, and it was just fascinating to me to see the farm and to see all these crops that they had grown and, and, and just hearing this guy talk about his knowledge of growing stuff. I mean, things that I just have no clue about, you know, the fact like one year he plants something here and then the next year you have to do a different, I mean, there's just so much that goes into cultivating and growing and growing things like that. So this morning, our parable that we're going to be looking at is the parable of the sower. And it was a parable specifically about growing things, about growing plants, about growing crops. Now, 
Fortunately, at the time that Jesus gives this parable, he's in an agrarian society. That means he's in a society where everybody grows stuff. That was your livelihood. You grew things because you couldn't go down to Walmart and buy everything you needed, or you couldn't click on Amazon and order everything you needed. So Jesus had that benefit. When he gave this parable, people had a common knowledge from which to draw from. Unfortunately, a lot of people are probably in my boat where we did not grow up in that type of society and we've had the luxury of stores and Walmart and whatever else to be able to buy our food and our groceries. So sometimes we we have to pause and think a little bit when we come across these to just get a better understanding of exactly what is going on and exactly what is being said here. So if you would turn in your Bibles, just turn to Mark chapter 4. Um, so that we can look and unpack the word of the Lord together. And as you do that, I'm just going to pray for us this morning. Lord God, I just thank you for the privilege we have of being able to dig into your word and to look at your word and, and see how it applies to our lives. Lord, I pray that as we look at your word that you would just guard me as I speak this morning. May I not utter anything that, uh, that you don't want to come out of my mouth. Lord, may we just honor and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as you are looking at the gospel mark, just a little bit of review for those of you. I know most of you have been here or you've been able to see the sermons, but we just came out of Mark chapter three and and we just saw this story of Jesus where he kind of clashes with the religious leaders. In fact, they accuse him of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. They accuse him of basically doing things out of the power and authority of Satan. And Jesus takes that accusation and turns it back on them and makes it very clear that it isn't he that is the one that's breaking, uh, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's them who have hardened their heart to God so much so that when they see the Son of God before their very eyes, instead of recognizing him as the Son and as the King, they accuse him of being Satan. He goes on and he gives one, one verse. If you look at the, va- the, the last verse in chapter three, he says, for whoever does the will of God, he it is that is my brother and my sister and my mother. That's where we left off. Jesus basically giving for us two examples, a couple examples, examples of what a false disciple looks like, which wasn't just the scribes and the Pharisees, it was even some of his own family members who doubted him, and the reality of what a true disciple of Jesus is looks like. So we're just moving right on from within that context where we come to chapter four, the parable of the sower. Now, a couple just introductory remarks about this passage in particular. It is a parable, and what is a parable exactly? Well, you probably already are familiar, but it's basically a story. That's a very easy way to describe it, but that's not really a complete way to describe what a parable is. A parable is a specific story. It actually uses that same, we have the word parallel, right? It uses that same root word para, which gives the indication that it is a story that goes alongside another story. It has a similarity. So just like it's a parallel story, in essence, is what it is. It's a story that parallels another story to make one common point or one common theme. Jesus often, when he teaches, uses parables, He uses this to explain and unpack for people the kingdom of God. Ultimately, what Jesus is really speaking about here is the kingdom of God, but he does it in this sort of story format. He gives these special stories to help give insights into the kingdom of God. That's what a parallel, a parable, excuse me, is used for. One thing, though, that's very important to note about parables is often, in order to fully comprehend, fully understand what a parable is, you have to have some sort of insight knowledge. You have to have some kind of, almost like an inside source to fully understand what they're talking about. A couple years ago, I was, uh, actually, we were living in Taiwan at the time, and I remember seeing this, uh, this, this article, and it was talking about how um, there's, there's a satire news outlet in the U.S. called The Onion, um, and it's, it's not a Christian, it's, it's, it's not a Christian one, but it's just, they produce satire, right? They kind of like have make, you know, they, they take stories and make them funny. Well, they had this article that they published and it said something about, and this was like right at the height of when North Korea is launching all these missiles and there's, you know, a lot of tension there. And it was something to the effect of, of America votes Kim Jong-un as like, 
as like the world's most attractive human being or something like that. They might have said it more provocatively, but that, that was the idea of the article, right? Was, it was just this joke about Kim Jong-un and what an amazing person he was, and, and it was complete satire. Well, there was news outlets in China who came across this article, and they know nothing of the onion. They don't know that it's satire, and they come across this, and they're like, whoa, the Americans voted Kim Jong-un as like the most popular, the best human being in all the world. And they literally published articles within Chinese newspapers and and websites that the US has declared Kim Jong-un as, I don't remember exactly what it was word, like the world's best man or something like that. Something that was published here with complete, a complete joke, right? Making, in, making fun, really, ultimately of the Korean leader. And yet, news outlets and media outlets in China, not knowing, not having a knowledge of the story, they don't have that insider information, they get it completely wrong. In fact, what was meant to kind of made fun of, they thought was meant to exalt and, and honor. But really, it had the opposite intention. So I share that because... When we come to parables in the Bible, parables, oftentimes, they are written for two different groups of people, and we're going to see that this morning. One is written specifically for those who are on the inside, so to speak, those who have a knowledge of who Jesus Christ is as their Savior. People who know Jesus, have a knowledge of Jesus, come to a parable, and they will see something very different than, uh, than those who do not. So I use that story just Keep that in mind as we go through this parable. We're going to see this theme, this idea of kind of insiders versus outsiders. It's going to come to light here in a very important way. We're going to just start the first couple verses here of chapter four is the setting. It gives us the setting for where we are. Again, just like in other passages, we see Jesus, he goes out, and immediately what happens? A large crowd gathers around Jesus. And so what does he do? You might remember this. This sounds just like back, I think it was early in chapter three, right? Jesus had a large crowd and they were kind of suffocating him, mobbing him. So he goes immediately to a boat. Now, there's really two probably major reasons why Jesus does this. One is because when the crowd is so intense and around him, he can't really function. He He cannot teach effectively. They're seeking the miracles and all the good things that Jesus is doing But what Jesus is about is teaching, about preaching the gospel, and he can't do that when they're surrounding him like that. So he goes out to this boat to kind of get away from them, which does two things. It gives him sort of a platform from which he can speak out of. But one thing that's kind of unique is is, is the people can actually hear him better, probably, when he's out on the boat. When when we were growing up, we used to go camping all the time to a lake, Um, probably, you know, multiple multiple weekends every summer we would spend at the lake. And I, I remember we would always, when we'd go camping, we'd have a big campfire right on the edge of the lake and there would be people, you kind of, every person had their spot, right? And at least where, where I grew up, it was, it was a little bit more you know, free range camping. I'm not sure what the, the term is for it. We didn't have designated like spots. It was just, you claimed your area and people really packed, people packed in there. And so we had our spot always and there'd be people up and down the beach of this lake. And of course, a lot of people were there kind of having a good time and playing music and it was loud. But honestly, in our little area, you couldn't, you couldn't really hear because it, it, was, it was blocked by the RVs and the campers and everything. So you didn't hear all the noise right around you very much. And I remember one day we were there and it just had a, a huge storm in the afternoon, like a massive storm where, um, you know, it was like blowing people's tents over and just like crazy intense winds. It was right before it got dark, and then it got dark, and all of a sudden it was just calm on the water. And we're sitting around this campfire, and all of a sudden you hear these like these people, like you can hear conversation. And it was it sounded like they were right next to us. And it was people sitting there discussing, like, I think we're stuck. I don't know where we are. How did we get out of here? And we're like, what is, where's that coming from? And we realized way out across the like little inlet where we were camping, there was actually an island out there and, and there was a little sandbar, a shallow sandbar in between where we were at to the island that you could actually walk all the way across. It was maybe like knee to waist deep. And we would do that during the daytime. And so we realized all out there in the middle of the water, we saw this little flashlight and we we determined that the voices were coming from these people way out in the middle of the water with this flashlight. But we could hear them as if they were like right there in our camp. 
So we realized they needed help, walked out there, and you know, it, they clearly had probably drinking a little too much because I start walking out and the one guy yells, it's a helicopter, they've come to rescue us, you know? And I'm like, oh, no, we're not helicopters. And the other guy goes, it's Jesus, he's walking on water. So, um, you know, there was a little bit of heresy going on there, but uh, they were delighted when we realized, when they realized they weren't gonna, they thought they were gonna drown. They thought they were like, they didn't know what was going on. So we kindly helped them. Um, got them back to the boat ramp and everything, and they were, you know, rescued. Their family had called the, like, state patrols. They are on the water looking for them. They thought they had sunk their boat or something. Anyway, I just share that because there's a reality that when Jesus was on the water, he could speak clearly, and his voice would carry. People could hear him from far distances. They could hear everything that he had to say. So here's Jesus before the crowd, and what does he do? He starts teaching yet again. But the, what he does for the first time, Mark records for us, is Jesus do, gives this story format, a parable. And this is the first section in all of Mark where, where Mark really records for us details about what Jesus has been teaching. So let's look in verses three to nine. Um, actually, as you do that, let me just say this. There's sort of an outline of this passage we're gonna look at. And there's verses three to nine are Jesus giving the parable. Um, And then in verses 13 through 20, you're gonna see that parable explained by Jesus. And if you were here last week, I talked about this this literary form that Mark uses. They often call it a Markin sandwich, which is just like a, a funny way to remember it. But what it really is is like bracketing is the technical term for it. And what Mark does is he he takes one story and he, while in the middle of that story, he interrupts it with another story uh, to help emphasize his main point. So we're gonna see that same thing happen here this morning in verses 10 through 12. It's another one of these other stories that all of a sudden interrupts the main story and Mark does that for a specific purpose. So just note that it's another one of these Mark and sandwiches that will help give us a little insight into what Jesus is teaching here. So verses three through nine, the parable. And the parable really is somewhat simple, isn't it? It's written in simple language. Actually, it's written in a language that would have been very easy for people to understand because they were farmers. They knew how to grow crops. They knew how to grow plants, unlike myself. They knew what it took. So Jesus shares this story, verse three. He says, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. Verse, Verse four. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road and the birds came and they ate it up. So the sower went out to sow, and the, seeds, and the seeds along the path, the birds came out to eat it up. Verse five, other seeds fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. After that, the sun had risen, and it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and immediately there was no crop. Just pause right there in in, in verse seven. So Jesus tells a story of a farmer, a sower. He goes out and he sows. He goes out and he plants seed. It's interesting because I think we look at this, my first thought was like, this is sort of weird, right? It sounds like he's just chucking seed anywhere. You know, and we get this idea in our minds that why would you throw seed on rocky soil? Why would you throw seed in a bunch of thorns? That's not exactly what's going on here. Actually, the farmer, I don't know, in like Taiwan and India, if you've ever been to another country, it's amazing where farmers farm. Like here we have these like perfectly square plots, right? And they're always like pretty flat, looks really good. When When I've been to other countries, you see these farmers And if the hill's like straight up, they somehow are growing crops on that hillside. It's just fascinating. You see their crops growing every possible place that they can. And that's what was going on here. A farmer was so desperate to make sure that he had enough crop to live off of that he would would sow seeds everywhere he thought he could possibly get a crop. And when he sowed these seeds, it wasn't always completely evident that there was, when it says rocky soil, for example, it didn't mean there was just like tons of boulders everywhere. In fact, in Israel, there was just a solid bedrock underneath a lot of the soil. So what happened was you would get a really thin layer of soil. So he's throwing seeds on everything looks almost the same. So you have soil, and at that point, you can't see the weeds, right? They haven't grown up. So he's sowing the seed all over, okay? He's not just like randomly throwing seed, but he's sowing it everywhere where there's soil to be sown. 
But what happens? Not everything takes root. In fact, there's three main problems he finds within the soil. The first, the first seed he sows, there's a complete inability to grow. The soil's so hard that the birds quickly eat the seed away before it can grow. So the soil can't even take root. It can't even start to grow into a plant. The second problem he encounters is that some soil takes root. It looks good immediately, right? But what happens? That soil takes root and it grows down and all of a sudden it hits that bedrock, right? And that root, the roots cannot grow anymore and so the, the plant shoots up but there's no base. There's no foundation and it doesn't take much for that plant to die, for it to wither away. The third problem is a problem of reproducing. The seed goes in, it looks like it's gonna be good, it looks like it flourishes, but all of a sudden you have all these thorns and thistles and and weeds that grow in all around it, so much so that it completely chokes out the seed. The actual crop ends up dying off because everything else sucks the nutrients away from it that it vitally needs to grow and reproduce. Then Jesus gives us a contrasting picture. Verse eight, other seeds, he said, fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop, and they produced 30, 60, and 100-fold. There's three things just to notice here. These things, what do they do? Well, immediately, they sprout. They take root, right? First, it says that they grew and increased. So they, they actually go from a seed to a plant, and they start growing, and then he goes on and he says, they produce 30, 60, and 100-fold. The idea behind this was just that these seeds grew and they not only produced a crop, but they produced an amazing a crop, a crop far greater than anybody could imagine. So you have a contrast between the seeds that go in the bad soil and the exact opposite of what happens when the seed goes on the good soil. That's the story, right? It just kind of ends right there and then Jesus says this in verse nine, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the first indication we get that there are certain people that are gonna hear this story and understand it. And there are certain people that aren't gonna hear anything. They're gonna hear it, and to them, they're gonna find no meaning in this story. But before Jesus gets on to explain the, the story, right, a simple story, before he explains it, suddenly we come to verse 10, and there's this interruption in the story. So this is that, that Mark and sandwich that we're gonna look at. Verse 10 says, as he was alone, his followers, along with the 12, they began asking him about the parables. Just to note here, Mark, likely what he does, this is an event that happens later in time. The disciples come to Jesus and they start asking Jesus questions, it says plural here, about the parables, okay? It's not specifically directed just at this parable of the sower, but they start asking him about the parables in general. So Mark takes this story and he puts it right here to help emphasize a point. So we need to note that. What is that point that he's trying to emphasize? So they start to ask him about the parables. And he was saying to them, these are the words of Jesus, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. This is a crucial point for us to understand here. What Jesus is saying to them, he's saying, to those of you who are my disciples, who are my followers, when you hear the parables, these parables unlock for you the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Do you remember back in in Mark chapter one? The very thing he talks about is he has come to proclaim the good news about what? The kingdom of God. That's what Mark is doing in these parables is he's helping to unravel or un- unveil before, before their very eyes what life in the kingdom of God looks like. So to those of you who are followers, this mystery is being unveiled to you in the parables. But to those of you who are outside, the text says, those of you that do not belong to me, those of you who are not followers of Jesus, everything to you is just a parable meaning everything to you is nothing but a story. There's no deep meaning for you to be found in this. This is a bit of a tough text to understand, to be honest. Because then he goes on in verse 12, 
And in verse 12, he quotes a passage from Isaiah chapter six. So to kind of like fully understand what's going on here, we're gonna just take a little side here. And in Isaiah chapter six, so this is what verse 12 says. So that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. It's a tough verse for us to to comprehend. But if we were to go back all the way to Isaiah, actually, if you have your Bible, I'll just turn there just to make it easier. Isaiah, turn to chapter five. And there's a parable written in Isaiah. And it's, it's, it's basically called the parable. It's the very first part of Isaiah chapter five. The parable of the vineyard is the title of it. And what happens in this parable is it's another story, right? And it's given... And, it's, and it talks about a, a person who cultivates a vineyard. And if you wanted to read it, I'm not gonna read it all verses one through seven, but basically you have two main characters. You have the cultivator of the vineyard, and then you have the vines that he's trying to cultivate. And it's a picture, it's an image for the people of God that Isaiah uses to help them understand because the vine refers to the Israelite people. And the cultivator is God himself. And what happens is he's saying, I've done everything. Well, I'm just gonna read. He says, he, verse one, let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed the stones, and he planted it with the choicest vine, right? So he prepares the ground and he plants it. He built a tower in the middle of it so that he could watch over it, right, and take care of it. He also hewed out a wine vat in it. He then, ex- then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless grapes. We'll just stop right there. So Jesus is talking about Israel here. And what he's saying, he's saying, I've taken you, I've done everything I can to cultivate the ground. I've given you every single reason you could think of to follow me, to honor me, to love me, to serve me. But what does Israel do as a nation, as a whole, continually, over and over and over? They rebel against God. Over and over again, they dishonor him, they displease him. They do the very things they're told not to do. They produce only worthlessness. So that's the backstory going into Isaiah 6 where these words come out and this is Isaiah's pronouncement of judgment on the people of Israel referring to this story and basically this is is what he says to them in verse, if you go back to Mark chapter four, that they see and not perceive and while hearing they may hear and they do not understand. Isaiah gives a warning to them that they see God, but they don't actually perceive him. You know, we can see things sometimes with our eyes, but we don't actually fully see everything that's happening. We talk about depth perception, right? To have the the perception to see things. I remember uh, in high school, I had a friend, he was a college student, and when he was young, he's a brilliant like mechanical engineer, a great mountain biker, uh, but when he was young, he was playing with his pocket knife and prying you know, something apart, and uh, he, he slipped, and his knife went right into his eye. And uh, it, it, it rendered that eye completely useless. He had a good sense of humor because it, it, it sliced his pupil in a way that it looked like a cat's eye. So he would always joke around and, you know, about his one cat eye that he could see with and stuff. But he was fully able to function in life for the most part. Until all of a sudden, and I, I, I thought of him no differently because he, could, he was a phenomenal mountain biker. He did all these amazing things. And one day we were making a softball team and I was like, Tim, you gotta play on our softball team. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I can't play softball. And he was like a really fit guy. And I'm like, yeah, we need you, you know? And he's like, no, I can't catch. And I'm like, you can catch. I've seen you like launch your bike off of these, ju-. you know? I'm just in my mind, I'm like, bro, you can do this. And so finally he's like, okay, fine, I'll play. So we're, we're you know, like trying to, be kind to him, so we put him in right field where the ball doesn't go very often because he didn't think he could catch. And, and, and all of a sudden, like, pretty soon we realized that, no, he was not lying. He literally could not play baseball or softball because he had no depth perception because of his eye. 
He couldn't see when the ball was coming. In fact, when we were warming up, we would you know, just play catch, right? And every time he would kind of go like this, the ball would be coming, and he would duck, and he would just stick his glove out. You know? And if it hit it, he would catch it. And uh, I thought he was just like joking until we realized, like, no, he couldn't see because the ball kept like hitting him in the face. And the same thing when he would come to bat, right? I mean, it's slow-pitch softball. So some guys strike out. I, I've, I've been there, so it's okay. But, but he could not see the ball. He couldn't tell. I mean, he's swinging, and the ball's like you know, way up in the air still. So he had zero depth for perception. See, the reality was my friend could see the game. He could watch the game. He could cheer on the team. But when it came to participating in the game, to actually being a part of the team, he couldn't do it. He didn't have the perception to be able to see clearly enough to know what was going on. Sort of similar to what Jesus is saying here. These people can see me. They've seen me. I've given them opportunities to see me, yet they don't actually see me in that way. They don't have the perception of sight to see me fully in what I'm doing. Their sight is limited. Same with hearing. They hear all about me, but they don't know me. They hear about all the good works I do, the miracles, everything that I'm doing, but they don't know me. They have no knowledge of God. No ability to perceive and no ability to know him as their savior, as their Lord. So here's the reality for us in this passage right here. God's kingdom has definite people who are inside his kingdom. And then there are those who are outside of God's kingdom. And there's no fuzzy middle ground on this. You're either in or you are out. When God speaks and gives a parable like this, you either know and understand who God is or you find yourself like the outsiders. You have no clue what's really going on because you don't know him as your savior. That's what Jesus is trying to tell them here, to tell the disciples. He speaks in this way because he's unveiling for those who see him, he's unveiling to them what the kingdom is like. But to those who refuse to see him, who refuse to know him, the parable is nothing but a story to them. Let's move on to the explanation of the parable, verses 13 through 20. Verse 13, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones who are beside the road, where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. There's really three elements going on in the parable here. And it's somewhat simple, you have a sower, you have a seed and you have soil, three things. So who's the sower? Well, ultimately the sower here is Jesus Christ himself. He's the one sowing the word, but we see Jesus give this very command to his followers. So it's meant to be Jesus, but we're also to look at it and understand that we also have been given the task of sowing. Jesus is the ultimate sower, but we also have the task of sowing seeds. There's not much said of the sower. It's funny we call this the parable of the sower because there's literally, this is the only thing the text says, is the sower sowed the seed. Basically, that's it, period, the end. We don't hear anything else about the sower because he sows the seeds. He doesn't do a whole lot else. Then there's the seed itself. Well, what is the seed? The seed in this passage is the gospel message. What is that exactly? That's repentance of your sins and faith and belief in Jesus Christ as your savior. It goes back to Mark chapter one. That's the very thing Mark talked, or Jesus talked about in Mark chapter one, is the gospel message. So you have a sower, and you have the seed, which is the gospel message, and then you have the soil. And this really is the emphasis here in a lot of this passage. It's the main thrust of the passage. Probably should be called the parable of the soils, but anyway, that's a side note. So who is the soil? Well, the soil is us, right? The soil are the people who are given the word, who hear the word, the people who the sower spreads the word to. They are the soil. And there's four examples here. We have three soils that are not good and one that is good. Verse 14, we have the hard soil, right? The hard soil, the soil that's thrown and it lands so close to the path that it's hard packed and it cannot penetrate. The birds come and they eat it, they take it away. In this passage, there's a direct connection here to the scribes and the Pharisees. 
So when we see that hard soil, that's who our mind is drawn to. There are those people who have hardened their hearts against God. We talked about that last week, right? That unforgivable sin, that deliberate hardening of one's own heart against the Holy Spirit's work, that's these people. Their hearts are hard and they've landed on hard soil. They cannot know God because they've hardened their heart and are unable to understand what he is saying. There's an image here though too that I think we need to catch. There's this image of Satan snatching away the seed, right? He's snatching away the seed, he's taking away the seed and there is an image of a war that is going on. There is a war waging between two kingdoms that are polar opposites. You have the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. That's what's going on here, that's what's at stake here. As God is coming down, his kingdom is being unveiled and it is, it is unleashing a war on the kingdom of Satan. You move on from there in verses 16 and 17. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places. That is, who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately they fall away. This gives us the idea of the masses, right? The crowds that are following Jesus. When they hear the word, it seems as if that the, the, it seems as if the plant takes root. It seems as if something's gonna happen. But their roots do not penetrate deep into the soil. In fact, they hit that rock and they don't grow anymore. So much so that it doesn't take much, right? It doesn't take but a barely, the slightest wind to blow these plants down and to destroy them, to make them useless or worthless. Just like us in our own lives, we see people that when it's popular to follow Christianity, when it's popular to be, to to do the things that Christians do, they proclaim it, they do all these things, but the first sign of persecution or difficult or, or calamity, they give up, they abandon. The reality was, Their faith was never real. It never fully took root. They do not know Jesus, just like the hard-hearted in the hard soil. Their roots did not penetrate as they should have. The next section is the crowded soil, the thorny soil, verses 18. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown, Among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. See, Jesus is making it very clear. Over and over we see here the word, the word. They hear the word. A a very important part of this passage is this, this verb to hear, Over and over and over you see to hear, to hear, to hear. See, they hear the word, but they don't know it, right? They have no knowledge of it. It goes back to that verse 12 we looked at. Because they have seen and not perceived and hear, but they do not know him. These people in verses 18 and 19, they the word, the 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 seed takes root and it appears like everything's going great, but what happens is they're choked out. The life is choked out of them so to speak. All these things come in their lives and suddenly they take the nutrients that that the plant needs and the plant dies. False religion, I believe, is marked by a lack of priority. How much is this here a warning to the American church today, I wonder? As we look around in the American church, I think of no other soil that fits our description better than this one right here, where we see the the seed come, we see the gospel take root in people's lives, and it appears as if they're truly following Jesus. But then before you know it, there's thing after thing after thing that takes priority over Jesus in their lives. Pretty soon, Christianity, their so-called relationship with Jesus, is marked by nothing than a simple traditional form. All it is is something they do every once in a while to check a box off of their list. They have no knowledge of Jesus as their savior. And I'll be honest, not only is this pointed at the American church, 
But I have to look at my own life here. How much do I struggle in this area? What about you? How much are these worldly distractions coming in and choking out your faith? How much are they coming in and taking away the nutrients that you need? They take that time that we should be spending with the Lord, that time we should spend serving the Lord, and we use it for all these other things that are of no value, that deem us worthless as like the vine in Isaiah 5. So we have these three soils. There's only one thing in common of all three of these soils, and that is that none of them are genuine, none of them end up as plants. They're all dead in the end. There is nothing there. We contrast that though with verse 20, the good soil. And it's interesting, there's only one verse devoted to all this. And I'll get to that in a second. Verse 20. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and they accept it and they bear fruit. 30, 60, and a hundredfold. See, in order to see Jesus, we have to perceive him. In order to hear him, we have to be able to know him. We have to think back to that verse in verse 12. There's only one response here for the true soil. That is a response of repentance and faith in Jesus alone as their savior. That is what marks the life of a believer, one who has repented, turned away from their sin, recognized their need of a savior. They do nothing to earn that salvation, but fall on their knees before a holy God and say, Lord, rescue me, a great sinner. That's a true believer, one who has repented and put their faith in Jesus. But one other thing to note here is this good soil, it takes, the plant takes root and it produces a crop. So not just is it knowing and believing in a, in a theoretical way, it is knowing Jesus in a way where it transforms your life so that your life is spent producing crops, producing fruits, right? So we get that image of producing fruits. Now, I just wanna be careful. What I'm not saying here, I'm not saying every single person needs to walk out these doors and be Billy Graham and, you know, start preaching and seeing thousands and thousands of people come to the feet of Jesus. But there is a reality that if your life is transformed by the power of the gospel, there ought to be fruit that is seen in your life. Maybe not everybody else sees it, but Jesus sees the fruit of your faith. I wonder this morning of our lives, is the fruit of our faith evident? Is it real? Is it lasting? Now we gotta be a little bit careful because I think it's possible to have false fruit, right? We can kind of conjure up some, some, some sort of fake fruit, something that looks like we're producing crop, something that looks like we're really genuinely reaching people, that we're really genuinely sowing the word of God. And we see this in the evangelical church, the so-called evangelical church all over the place. I feel like more and more today we see pastors who are more about glorifying themselves, their brand and everything else, and they don't care at all about seeing lost people genuinely have their lives transformed. Where's the fruit in our lives? See, many give an appearance that looks like an insider, but that appearance is meaningless. God is not fooled if there is no fruit in our life. So I wonder this morning, where are you in this? Where am I in this? Are we on the inside with Jesus? Have we repented of our sins, put our faith in Jesus? And has that faith taken root in our life so that it comes out of everything we do? So that transforms our everyday walk with Jesus? Again, I'm not trying to call us to perfection here, but there's a reality that when you are a follower of Jesus, your life is being continually sanctified through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus' work in your life. Is that evident in my life? Is that evident in your life? 
Is the fruit that you see genuine? Or perhaps are you like that hard soil? That soil who's heard the words over and over. You think of Israel, right? They had every reason in the world to believe in God. I mean, God took them, I mean, rescued them in the most miraculous ways. Look at what he did in Egypt when he took them out of the hands of Pharaoh, right? He marched them, marched them out of there with miracles all over the place. Every reason to believe and to follow and to honor God and they still failed to do that. We need to be careful not to just think that we're not capable of that same thing because I think we are. We can harden our hearts. We can have a hardened heart and not realize it like the Pharisees and the scribes. Is it possible that you're like the rocky soil where roots have gone down, they've actually penetrated the soil and things look good until things start getting hard, right? Until all of a sudden it's not popular to be a Christian anymore. I have news for you in our culture, in our nation right now, it is becoming very unpopular to be a Christian, at least to be a Christian who abides by the word of God to be a Christian who stands for the things that the word of God clearly teaches about. Are you like the rocky soil where you just give up, your faith is abandoned when things get tough, when it's difficult? Is it possible that you're like the thorny soil where the roots have gone down in and it seems that you're sold out for Jesus? But in reality, everything else in life takes precedence over Jesus. Again, I I feel this one so pointedly in my own life. There is a deep struggle, and I have to sit there and question myself. God, keep me from being like this. I hope you take this seriously in your own life, because there are thousands and thousands of things vying for our attention. Satan is using everything he can to distract us, from the one thing that matters most to us, or ought to matter most to us, worshiping our Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't fool yourself by looking at this list and say, oh, well, maybe I struggle at this one, but that's probably not as bad as that one. These are all equally bad, okay? There's only one commonality in all of them. Every single one lands itself in the outsider category. So you're either in or you're out. Those are the only two options, in or out. I ask myself this, where's the fruit in my own life? Not fruit that I'm exalting for other people to see, but is there genuine fruit in my life that God looks at and sees and knows? Is there genuine fruit that I can point to and say, God, you're doing a work in my life, I know it. See, the reality is to be part of that inside group, it's not just a mere one-time prayer that we make where you receive like a fire insurance policy. It is so much more than that. A life committed to Jesus, a life of somebody who's in the good soil is a life that is rooted in Jesus. It cannot be stamped out. It cannot be blown away. It cannot be plucked out because it finds its roots deep within Jesus Christ and the saving work of Jesus on the cross alone. It has nothing to do with what, we, what we've done in our own lives. Are those the roots of your faith? That they took a horrible, despicable sinner and you are transformed by the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is there evidence of that fruit in your life? I go back to this sower. I said at the beginning a little bit that there really isn't a lot said about the sower. But one thing I think that's important to note, there's not a lot said because we are given this task of sowing seed. And I think all too often today, we take that task to mean that somehow we have to do something amazing or creative. We have to do something unique in order for that seed to take root. No, it has nothing to do with us and what we do. We sow the seed and we trust God, and he alone causes that seed to grow. He alone causes that seed to take root. We pray and trust him with those results. Are you sowing seed today? Are you sharing the gospel with people around you? Are you talking to people, friends and neighbors? Are you living a life where people question and say, there's something about you that's just different or unique? 
Are you able to share how Jesus has transformed and impacted your life? The contrast between these soils can't be more different. You're either inside part of God's kingdom or you're not. You're part of the kingdom of Satan. There's two kingdoms at play and you're in one. So which is it? This is the kingdom of God that Jesus is unfolding for us. A kingdom where desperately lost, hopeless sinners have their lives transformed by the glorious, wonderful mystery of Jesus dying on the cross, bearing that punishment of our sin, and taking us in and welcoming us to his kingdom and saying, you are part of my kingdom. I urge you, friends, this morning, put your trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. I hope that you are certain which kingdom you are part of this morning. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I just stand before you. Lord, I know in my own life, I just always want to dismiss and say, of course that's not me, of course that's not me. Lord, would you help me to examine my own heart and my own life? Lord, if there's areas in my life or in the lives of anybody here at this church that do not reflect you, that are not honoring to you, Lord, would you illuminate those before us? Lord, would you give us eyes that not just see but perceive you where we can know you in an intimate way? Lord, may we truly grasp the mystery of the good news of Jesus Christ. Come down to die on the cross and rescue us from our life of sin. Lord, we praise you because you ought to be praised. We honor you because you ought to be honored. And Lord, our hope is that we glorify you as a church and individually as followers of Jesus. As we go from here this morning, Lord, may you be glorified. You alone receive all glory and honor and praise. Amen. stand with us for our final song. Spin.
may our lives be a holy praise unto the Lord. I lost my place, sorry. (laughs) In Philippians chapter 4, verse 20, Paul writes, Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we go from here, may you go in that knowledge and that understanding and that encouragement. To God alone be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.